up and actually being um, and doing something um, not as useful as I could be. Having said that, we've got non-medical and it's been fantastic. And it doesn't mean that just because you're non-medical does not mean that you can't contribute. So anyone really can contribute. So when I heard about this opportunity, um, I was desperate to get involved. So when Simon asked, do you want to come along? I snapped at the opportunity. So just over three years ago, um, uh, Simon, I and Sharon and Ian um, embarked on our flight to um, sunny Zambia and left behind a very cold and rainy Birmingham um, grey sky. So um, it was the first time that Ian and Sharon and I had met um, and it's been um, a start of a very good friendship and we're, we're fantastic family friends still as we've dealt with Simon as well. So um, even more to gain. So we had a, um, a lovely welcome at the airport by Pastors Felix and Michelle Chimber. Um, and when we arrived at our accommodation, it was so beautiful and tranquil that actually my first thought was, how do I sell this to my family and friends and make it look like I'm not on holiday and I am going to do work really hard. So as I'll go through the pictures. It is hard to believe that we are working, but it was a beautiful um, place to come home to and rest at the end of the day. So um, the... The thing about Lusaka and then Zambia, really, um, I've heard of great things, but never really knew much about Zambia. Um, and I didn't want to read on a huge amount before I went because I wanted to find out by it for myself um, and had no preconceptions of the place. But actually, they have a huge amount of similarities, you know, like things like malls and things are, are pretty much like we have at home. But then you have the other extremes of size that um, that you, you just do not see in the West. So it's a great chance to kind of see the different cultures and, and learn about experience. So we we're always really welcome and treated so um you'll see a theme here where there's quite a lot of food involved um and um and i justified it by working you know and seeing lots of patients but um we had a lovely um church congregation welcome us and um we even have an amazing cake um and a little bit pressurized they decided to ask me to cut the cake and being a surgeon i felt the need to, to cut it really evenly and straight so i think i did okay but um but yes, it was all it was all really, really lovely to see. So um, before we'd started any clinical work, we were given a really great opportunity to, um, and I'm sure Simon had a lot to do with this, um, to basically um, broadcast an interview nationally about our work, what we were about, and, and basically um, popularizing um, eye um, conditions and, and promoting health um, for your eyes which actually I think a lot of people don't realize. And, and as I went through the two weeks, I realized how little was known about um, you know, eye health. It was almost the, the patients were said, well, it's a given, you, know, you age and your eyes get worse. That's just, that's not normal for them. So, um, so basically went to see uh, national, Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation, a bit like the BBC. Um, so we went to see the studio and this is recording from, from what we did. If you got some volume, Anna. Oh, no. can you hear that? No. Okay. Apologies. Sorry if it's not coming through. Um, that's a shame. So I don't, I'm not sure if the videos are coming through though. So anyway, as I was saying, so three days into our trip, I'm here. You say, "Well, did you do any actually any work?" Um, and I just thought I'd. I'd take more photos of the vibrant um, uh, place that we were staying in, but we did start to do some work. Um, so a little bit background, I've only ever really worked in the NHS, UK hospitals, um, which are extremely well equipped in terms of gadgets and, and toys, highly trained nurses, technicians, um, you know, a huge array of team of orthoptists, optometrists, secretarial staff, reception staff, booking team for clinics and theatre. So, as a very small team now in Zambia, having to do a similar thing out there was, it was very different. So just in terms of the equipment that we use, um, for example, we have the, the sit lamp, um, which we do in clinic, we always have in every clinic to examine eyes. Um, 
things like um, OCT machines to, uh, to scan the back of the eyes, indirect lenses to see a wider field of the back of the eye, a bit more detailed examination in terms of things like retinal detachments, um, a pachymeter which measures the thickness of the cornea, um, an ultrasound B scan which scans the back of the cornea, a bit like having a, a, an ultrasound for a baby, but if we can't see the back of the eye, then this is a great, great method to, to do that. Um, this is a visual field test, which we use to um, assess and examine patients, especially with glaucoma, so the optic nerve, um, and another visual field test, which we use a lot more in um, when we're looking at the optic nerve uh, pathology, the neurological conditions. Um, scans doing a fluorescing angiogram, where we have really good images of the blood vessels at the back of the eye. Um, the newer forms like the Optos machine, where we have um, a very wide field, about 200 degrees of the retina, so that, you know, looking through small pupils or even children are much easier with this machine and documentation. Um, things like Pentaclamp, which looks at corneal conditions and the curvature, and many, many other specialized scans like MRI and CT. So that is the contrast to what we had in Zambia, which is a visual, um, a visual acuity chart, handheld slit lamp, which is like a portable slit lamp where um, we also use in our normal clinics, but this allows us to um, carry it around in much smaller bag and, and very mobile and, a, uh, and a, a pressure measuring machine. So this is essentially, in addition to some drops um, and floors and dye is what we had um, held disposable. So you can imagine a much smaller team of much fewer equipment um, is what we, what we, um, what we had available. Um, the, the good thing about ophthalmology is that the majority of conditions are diagnosed and, and seen pretty much just by appearance of the eye. So visually, we can see most things without the fancy gadgets. But those are in addition to what we see in, in terms of what we actually diagnose. So it kind of narrows things down. And that's much more detailed for monitoring. But actually, with the equipment that we had, we were able to diagnose probably over well over 90, 95% of our patients. Um, and treat a lot of them because we had some some lubricating drops. So the first that where we started, um, and some of the pictures will be a replica of, of um, Simon's um, photo. So we started our first um, clinic in a local parish, um, and we were joined by more team members from the UK and locally. So as Simon said, um, we as soon as we arrived, there was uh, you know already a fair amount of people waiting. Um, for us and obviously they were aware and we promoted it and it was fantastic to see because the, the more people arrived the more people we could treat and help um, and actually there was a women's clinic um, uh, at the same time I think providing HPV vaccinations so we kind of saw and, and the patients could see us um, at the same time. So in the main hall we had um, patients being um, set for their vision um, and um, given sort of numbers so Sharon and Ian were very fantastic at allocating them so that they can some kind of order or formality. Um, Ian were then able to document uh, with photos of them and, and given them a clinical record. So unlike the UK where we have notes for the patients on our system or electronic or in hospital notes, in Zambia the patients had their own records that they kept with them. So they would hand you very sort of um, probably kind of folded up pieces of paper with scribbles on them, essentially document their clinical, whichever condition that they were seeing, whichever specialty they were seeing. So it wasn't the best way and you'd rely on the patient to essentially not lose them um, and have them uh, and documented accurately. Um, so we would document on these paper as well, so for their own notes. But in addition, we documented ourselves so we could put an electronic record together for the patients. Um, so this is a room that we actually saw the patient in and you can see as beautiful as a, the, the you know Zambia is in terms of the summer and the, and the, the warmth and the sun it's actually not great for for clinics because we need to work in fairly dim or dark conditions because with the lights that we're using it reflects too much if we don't if we don't have something um, dimmer so we're trying to you know close the windows or the, the doors as much as possible so um I basically had my array of equipment next to me, the patient or chair in front of me. Um, and as soon as one patient sat down, I did, you know, brief history, examine the eyes, document, keep them if I could. Um, and then once they were given the correct you know, some information or device, then they would leave and the next patient would sort of take, take their next seat. So it was sort of a bit of a conveyor belt, but actually we became 
you know, as the weeks went on, became very, very efficient at this because I knew if the language barrier was an issue, actually just examining the eyes, pretty much got my diagnosis fairly quickly without having to go through a long history, which we have the privilege of in the NHS, but not in, not so much in when we were, we were out there. So this is a lovely photo of Joy, who's in the centre, taking um, a patient's vision. So she's a scrub nurse um, from Zambia working in the NHS. And Joy really worked closely with us. Um, and I got very easily distracted with anything small and cute. So um, that was my little break as I kind of cuddled a few, a few kiddies. So more delicious food provided by the local community, as Ian said. Um, and we were just very, very, very lucky. Um, so you know, when we worked hard, we worked hard, but when we were rested, we were very well treated. Um, so Dr. Addy, um, as Simon said, um, worked also with, with us in Heartlands Hospital, um, and he joined us um, in, in the team as well. Um, and that's, you know, some happy faces at the end of, of the clinic. So we were able to attend a few of the orphanages, and there are many orphanages in Zambia, and sadly needed by children who have lost their parents to HIV and AIDS and, and due to poverty. So, as Simon said, we did manage to um, bring over as much kind of things as we could um, and um, donate some of those. But obviously, they're, they're always needing donations, um, and it could be anything, you know, children's clothes, equipment, shoes, anything really. So, one of them um, was this at House of Moses, and we were able to see the children. And, you know, as hard as the staff work and as well as they are looked after, there is just not sufficient volunteers um, because they're not really paid. So the volunteers are few, children are many, and so the children were, you know, really um, didn't have the stimulation that I guess we're used to having in the in the UK. Um, and it was really sad, heartbreaking to see. Um, and as a parent, it's not something that you, you you'd want any children or want to see any children in. Um, and it's just, yeah, it it um it's quite insightful um, and uh, very eye opening. So. As I said, Ian and Sharon were in charge of documenting the 900 patients that we saw, their records, and hats off to them for reading doctors' handwriting um, at a speed. You know, when we write, it's pretty bad as it is. And also decoding ophthalmology abbreviations, because any ophthalmologist will know that you take about two years to actually understand and learn all the abbreviations that's involved. Um, so this was fantastic. So we were able to digitize um, for the future records and also have photographs with them um, at the patient's consent. So. Um, I am seen here to pretend to do some work um, on a clinical presentation for the eye hospital doctors um, and Simon also working hard liaising with lots of people um, within within Zambia. So as you can see, we worked really hard, but we had this kind of backdrop to, to enjoy. Um, just another orphanage, really, I wanted to sort of show you. Um, essentially, it was a self-sufficient um, in the sense that it was an own farm and had animals and, and plants and things, and they all sold many things that um, of their products to sustain themselves. So they were essentially, again, volunteers, um, but they just had such a fantastic setup that um, they didn't rely so heavily and, and solely on donations, but they had their own, you know, crops and things. The children were able to um, have lots of free space to, uh, you know, enjoy themselves um, and interact. Um, and the, um, there was a school and college on site with a lovely newly built library. And what they wanted to do was um, provide not only a really loving and happy environment for the children to grow up in, but also educate and develop them so that they can become independent adults, essentially. Um, and um, the lovely caretaker came and say hi too. So we had a lovely time going around and just seeing how, how if done well, uh, a, an independent system can work um, just by, again, similar to us, essentially, as people just wanted to help and setting something up that is continuous rather than just just putting in money, um, a financial, you know, not that they, they wouldn't benefit from that. Um, so when I asked them what they would, you know, um, be needing them and ben would benefit from donations, they said anything in terms of school equipment, stationary books, um, clothes are always welcome. So um, we do currently regularly ship over any any donations clothes we have especially um books and things for children are really really useful so on the first of october we moved to another parish and again we set up a temporary clinic um, and saw as many patients as we could again we had a fantastic tv coverage um on site and you can see 
um, Dr. Adi um, helping and seeing patients as we went along. So the patients that we saw um, were, majority of them were fairly simple things like dry eyes. Um, and obviously with the environment and the work that they do outside, it's, it's not uncommon that they would have very dry eyes. The symptoms are easily rectified um, and, and provided some drops and hopefully that they will be able to get some more of their drops. So at least we gave them a diagnosis and it was nothing significant. Another big chunk was that they had refractive errors. So um, prescribing glasses. So the problem was in, in terms of the provision for glasses that they do get, so, so um, the government supports eye tests. So they will be free eye tests, but the glasses themselves can be extremely expensive and they can be even up to the cost of say glasses in the UK. So for, for your average Zambian citizen with their wage, it is just not possible. And I've seen glasses where they've been fixed over and over again. They've been smashed, fixed again, smashed and fixed again. And after a while, there's so much sellotape over these glasses that it's probably not as you know even helpful just to take the glasses off. Um, that one aspect that that I you know that, that was an issue. Um, the other thing is because some of them have never had an eye test in their life, and this is their first time that they've ever had anyone look at their eyes. So in terms of um, it never being access to opticians, not as a child. Um, so things like glaucoma don't get diagnosed. Whereas we have, every time we have an eye test here, our pressures get checked. So when diagnosed glaucoma, for example, especially in Afro-Caribbean um, ethnicity, um, is very poorly managed and controlled and they advance a lot quicker. So there was, it was quite, you know, almost once a day, I would see someone in their forties or fifties with bilateral loss of vision, um, being the, the provider of the family, um, and often they will be working on farms, so they would have lost their sight because it's not being picked up and they'll be guided in by their 12 year old children because they're blind. And that it's really heartbreaking because it's a preventable disease. Um, and had they had the access to it early on, it would have been something that not, may not have stopped them from deteriorating, but certainly have slowed it down. So things like drops, laser surgery is not something that they would have even knowledge of. And, and as I said before, um, there's a huge, um, a lot of people would just um, accept the fact that your eyes deteriorate and you lose sight. And, and that's a given. And they don't question and they don't ask and they don't go to the um, opticians or doctors and go, something's not quite right. They just accept it, which is something I think we do need to work on in terms of education. So, um, so more, it's more cuddly things and more food provided. Um, this may not work again, but essentially it was another recording of the of the um, footage that we had, which was fantastic. So unlike previous trips that I, I understand, we didn't work in our high ice hospital or do any operating. Um, and the main reason was that we felt those that couldn't access the hospital were at the most need for um, for support from us um, and free eye care. So or a diagnosis, at least so that they had a diagnosis and whether they were able then to go on to get glasses or have treatment um, or reassured, um, you know, th that's the next step. So unfortunately, a lot of them were diagnosed with cataracts. And although they have a diagnosis, it doesn't mean that they are able to do anything about it, but it almost made them feel um, better just to able to have a diagnosis of, well, this cataract is not something we can't do anything about, but whether it's like financially they're able to do, um, which was limiting them. So we did donate some surgical equipment to the eye department um, and I, I presented a few um, lectures on oculoplastics and the, and the lacrimal system. Um, so what I found was quite interesting just to sort of as a little thing for myself is that these are the kind of posters that we see in the GP practice and in the hospital, you know, typical diabetes, blood pressure, probably stroke symptoms and, and et cetera. And these were the sort of like posters that I saw in the hospital that I went in Zambia. So cholera, um, uh, the um, malaria, Ebola. Um, so it was interesting for me because it's such a contrast to what we normally see. So, um, so yeah, very, very eye-opening. So this is, um, again, what Simon showed you was the surreal clinic that we found ourselves in and everything was outdoors. It was about of fresh air. Um, again, it wasn't easy because, as I said, we need a dim or dark light, uh, sort of dark room to examine patients. So the, the sunlight reflecting from the slip lamp wasn't particularly easy, but we managed. Um, and we had a, a, a beautiful rendition from a, um, 
the staff who actually at first I was I was like, I thought wow they they've got a ban for us to you know just examine patients but as it turns out they do this on a regular basis so it wasn't just for us but it was beautiful and I'm afraid I'm sorry, but if I play the video, it might not show, but it was just such a surreal but beautiful You can try it, Anna. You I can try it. it. I will try it. <laughs> so, um, so I was doing clinic under a tree with chicks running around between my feet, um, and it was probably one of the best moments of my career. Uh, and I thought, this needs to be done more in the NHS. Because I think I'm happy to happy a patient. Um, and by the way, the lunch did not involve the said, clin uh, said chick. So uh, just, to, just to reassure you. Um, so I will, I will show, I'll try and play this video, but. Um, oh, does that play? It's playing. It is playing, but uh, this, uh, the sound, let's see if we can see this, yeah, the sound as well. No, it's not playing the sound. Oh, that's a shame. Anyway, it, it was, yeah, it was, a, it was beautiful and there was drums and everything. Anyway, I just wanted to join in and dance. So we um, next we spent two days in uh, Chilanga. Um, and as, as, as it was said previously, when we arrived in the morning, there was literally a, a queue outside the tent. So we're able to use um, the UNICEF tent that was already there. It wasn't very large. <laughs> not much airflow showing so it was quite a warm and tense as it got hotter throughout the day so you can see Simon's doing the visual acuities and Michelle taking notes for the vision um but as the tent got busier they got they got chucked outside basically <laughs> um the patients got handed a slot number and a queuing system which Sharon tried to keep in some kind of orderly fashion um so being an ex-school teacher was probably the best kind of person to do this but at times, she did actually use military style force as some of the patients tried to barge themselves into the small tent, thinking that they could get in the tent that they get seen that day. But it, it was it was getting getting little um, uh, sort of raucous and and actually, I, you know, I, I, I was tempted to, to, to hand her a sort of a, a, almost a fake pellet gun just to shoot in the air, just because everyone was just coming towards the tent at, at high speed. So um, but it was it was all fine. There was no there was no trauma, no, no, no clinicians were damaged and um, we were joined really lovely by the local ophthalmologists um, in their free time so they came to help us um, and a lot of the patients uh, so a lot more patients got examined um, and some of the children got refracted which was great because um, I'm not great at refraction it does take time as well to do so um, you know and this highlighted to me that there were so many children that's never had an eye test before so unlike the UK where um, Sort of at, at, at primary school level, all the children are screened at school for their vision, visual, uh, you know, visual problems, uh, any prescriptions. So we know from very early age that the patient, that, that the children aren't um, able to see well and correct it. Now, if if children don't have good vision, they are then not going to learn, and are deemed as almost like slow, where they're not. They just need better vision. So they were. Um, there were busloads of children that were shipped over um, and, we, and we were able to see them, which was great. Um, but it, it really highlighted the lack of um, the provision for these children. Uh, and these children are gonna grow up to go into careers and support their families. Um, and starting off with very poor vision in some of them was, was just, um, it just seemed so difficult to accept. Um, we had great support from medical students as well. So um, they were in placement and we managed to teach, or Simon managed to teach them to do visual acuities in a short time. So it just goes to show we can train people up um, to do lots of the things that would, would be the basics of really um, eye examinations. Um, and, um, and they really seemed really happy to do this. So end of a few um, very busy weeks, felt very productive and were still lots of smiles. And I think in fact, we, were, we looked happier afterwards than we were at the beginning. So, Again, very sport by the hospitality and the food. Um, and I just fell in love with the people. Um, so it's a beautiful country, beautiful people. And for someone that's not, maybe I've never been actually to any African country, um, and Morocco, I don't think really counts, but you know, there are similarities and there are differences. Um, and I think without going almost to just experience it and be in the middle of it, it's hard to even describe to you. So I can jump up and down and show you lots of holiday pics, but actually just immersing yourself in that kind of environment 
is life changing. And I would would recommend it highly to anyone even thinking about it to actually just give it a go. Not as daunting as you think it may be, um, is what, what I'd say. Um, and that actually being out of your comfort zone for a little while, but with the support of a fantastic team, you know, who have experienced a very, very experienced in going out there um, is, is the best way that you could be. It's not something I'm doing on my own. It's with a great team who's been experienced. So what have I gained from, from this? Um, so as Simon said, in eight days, we saw 900 patients and um, Gail, one of the, one of the uh, people listening right now is one of our senior nurses at Warwick where I work. And please don't go back to the, to the, to the managers and say, Anna saw 900 patients in eight days. Um, <laughs> because, because I know what happened to my clinics, but it, it's just to show actually take away all the equipment on all the um, red tape, perhaps I would say, is that we can get through so much with just a small team we have and the small and the basic setup we have. So nothing's impossible. And had you said to me, I'll be seeing 900 patients in eight days, I probably would have fainted um, before I went there. But, you know, and I think I don't, I don't think we even got the number until, you know, um, Ian and Sharon topped it all up. And I, I just, I just couldn't believe it. I, I thought they were making this up. And, you know, I thought, I thought they just added a few zeros for, for, for laugh. So it is possible. Um, I think we need to do a huge amount of healthcare education in the community with the patients, not only for eyes, but, you know, or, or, or lots of things that we take granted for. Um, we've identified areas of education for the local, local doctors. And, um, you know, we have great training in the UK. And I have to say the UK is probably one of the best training places for ophthalmology. And, and that's not matched in places like Zambia. So I think what we can give in terms of education for nurses and doctors out there as much as we can it will be fantastic um so we've had already had lectures from for various um consultants in the uk and i think it's been it's gone down very well um i've got a new family in zambia so you know i would communicate with them quite often and it's so warming because we've been through something quite tough together and i think that's not something that you can really replicate easily um, and I've made long-term friends in the UK as well, like Sharon and Ian, who uh, we see often. Um, and of course about future trips and, and projects. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go over this a little bit again about the, the glasses. Now, you know, this is, I'm not sure how accurate this is, it's just kind of pulled off of the internet, but um, generally speaking, you know, 75% of, 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 of people who are employed in Zambia are earning less than 740 pounds a month. So add on top a pair of glasses, which uh, probably cost up to anything in the hundreds uh, for a pair of glasses. Maybe a couple of people in the family may need this on top of the accommodation, the food, the bills and all the other things that goes on. It is not an insignificant amount. So um, we managed to try get some frames um, donated. And, you know, again, it's something very simple for us that we don't think about. But if that's what they're short of, then... It, I, I think it would be great to provide that for, for them. And the other thing we need is um, eye tests in schools. So the one thing I, I thought would be good is to actually train the teachers or even school nurses if they have one to actually do visual acuity. So most children will be absolutely fine, but it will identify a small percent of patient, uh, children who have really poor vision and then send those on to be examined um, and or given glasses to correct them. And they should be free glasses for children. I really do feel that. Um, obviously, this is in partnership with Zambian Health Department and donations and you know businesses, etc. Um, so it's not done by one person or two. It's got to be a whole community. Um, as I said before, leaflets on eye conditions will be great, um, just because then it will allow them people to, to take it away, um, have a read, and, and share it between them as well. Um, and I think the next really big step is to have our own independent permanent location where we can set up our own clinics and theatre where we have the autonomy to then dictate when we can be out there um, and no, not have to rely on other premises which may be used anyway. Um, as I said, the conditions are difficult. When we went, it was hot, it was tiring. So I almost feel like we could be even more efficient have, had we got the equipment like the, uh, an actual flip lamp um, in, on site. So I just want to leave you with this. It's something that I saw um, on a roadside. Um, <laughs> and, um, 
So Dr. Zulu uh, promised a whole list of things he or she could help me with. Um, and then the, well, what I'm particularly drawn to was a magic wallet. Um, so I would love to have a magic wallet so that our charity could just do whatever we wanted. So next time, I didn't have time to contact him. So next time we're in Zambia, I'm going to give Dr. Zulu a little call <laughs> and say, I'd like to see the magic wallet, please. Thank you very much for listening. And that is everything that I have to say today. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Yeah, you can stop yeah, sharing. Uh, wow. Uh, yes. That's uh, that's an amazing, uh, amazing presentation. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Anna. She's been to Zambia and that's uh, what uh, she had to, uh, to say. And I'm happy to report Anna and to other trustees. Uh, Dr. Sivaraj will be giving us uh, a talk on diabetic eye just next uh, but i uh, just uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments uh, please uh, reserve them uh, towards the end either to dr anna and other people that are presenting tonight but as you can hear from um, uh, dr anna that's our experience uh, in zambia and i'm and i'm happy to announce that uh, in terms of transportation when we started going we could go with just a few suitcases but uh, uh, thanks be to God, uh, uh, Helen uh, and the team uh, from um, uh, National Police Convoy uh, UK, which is a charity. They, uh, they have become uh, a very good source of support and help uh, in the last container, which will be arriving in Zambia in the next few weeks. Uh, they have given us as well some extra glasses, uh, which we will be donating and to help um, our friends in Zambia. And it's becoming much easier to send more uh, staff and um, uh, Moritas and uh, uh, Ian Connor will uh, share more, but we just want to uh, to appreciate uh, uh, the great work and teamwork that we are uh, we are seeing. Can you imagine a, a medical doctor from UK? You go out there and then you are able, two of you are able to see 900 patients. It's out of this world, but um, that's what. Uh, uh, charity is all about to help uh, uh, people uh, in need and where services are needed. Uh, we work in the world where somebody will wait for 10 minutes, they will come storming to say, I don't want to see this doctor, why am I waiting and all that. Uh, but sometimes you need uh, some experience, uh, get to some places like Zambia and other places uh, and see how people appreciate uh, the services that uh, you offer. And I'm sure Dr. Misa, all the way from Ndola, she will uh, maybe share share a bit more light. So let's move on uh, today as we have this interactive uh, I care for Zambia charity, uh, which Anna, she's uh, one of the trustees, uh, Dr. Ian Corner and myself, uh, we are trustees uh, on this and please feel free uh, if what you are hearing is something that uh, you can support or you can suggest to us what uh, can be done, please uh, feel free. Uh, you can either type in the chat or get in touch with us uh, even after this to see how best we can um, save uh, and help people out there. Uh, let's cross over to uh, Dr. Sivaraj, who is an um, uh, ophthalmology consultant uh, and uh, very, very uh, well established uh, in the area of uh, uh, diabetic eye and other things and it's one of the people uh, that have influenced me uh, to study and I'm happy to tell you Sivaraja there was a time I was assisting his clinic uh, and then he, we, we had a conversation and he began to tell me uh, Simon uh, what are your future plans what do you want uh, and all that and we shared and I'm happy to report to you that uh, actually i might be taking another uh, degree program uh, next year because of the statement you made to me to say simon you need to study a bit more what do you want to do and uh, i've done some a uh, few things uh, in between thank you sir and uh, let's move on to dr Svaraj uh, to talk about diabetic eye what is diabetic eye can diabetes affect our eyes and if diabetes can affect our eyes uh, what can we do and what should be uh, should be done and we've got a uh, 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 eye consultant uh, today uh, who is uh, uh, well versed uh, in that uh, field and area and uh, I just want uh, to cross over 
to Dr. Sivaraji and uh, one day uh, we've been planning uh, he will come to Zambia and uh, offer his services. Uh, over to you Dr. Sivaraji and please uh, uh, post in the chat uh, if you are able to hear us correctly or if the sound is not okay so we can check um, uh, from this end. Over to you Dr. Sivaraj. Thanks Simon, thanks for this wonderful opportunity. It'll be a hard act to follow Hannah. I hope I don't put you all to sleep. <laughs> I have two different lectures. Um, the first one is just to show you what um, you can expect to see in this dreaded disease called diabetes. And I would probably go into um, the retinal problems associated with diabetes in the second lecture, um, which will probably be a bit more scientific. So if I can just share my screen. Um, okay, so let's start with the ocular manifestations of um, which you would see in diabetes. Yeah. So the diabetes is a, a disease which um, not only affects almost every part of your body, but every part of the eye as such. So it can affect everything from the lids back to the back of the eye and also affect the mobility of your eye. And one can expect things like recurrent styes and in some unfortunate people, things like orbital cellulitis and orbital cellulitis caused by fungal disease such as mucomycosis, which makes it very difficult to treat. Uh, with regards to what you can expect in the cornea, patients with diabetes can have recurrent corneal erosions, and that could be a setup for infective keratitis, and the infective keratitis can be uh, site-threatening if it's not treated appropriately at the right time. So here is a, an eye which has been devastated by an infective keratitis with blood vessels growing into the cornea, making it opaque, and unfortunately, the patient loses vision because of this. You can also have intraocular inflammation uh, affecting the eye, and you can have it, the inflammation affecting the front of the eye, causing iritis, where you have a flower-like pupil. Uh, sorry, Sivaraji, would you mind move the slides uh, if you put them in the full uh, screen? Uh, they are not moving on this end. I'm not sure if others can see them move. Um, are you seeing it move now? No, not really. Uh, maybe if you put it back in full screen. Uh, okay, let me try and share it again. Are we seeing it move now, Simon? Uh, yes, there was one movement. Uh, there, uh, there was one move. Um, or maybe if you stop it and restart it, maybe. Uh, sorry, if that's okay. No problem. Uh, tell me if you can see it moving now. Uh, not yet. Hmm. Not sure. Let me stop, share and try again. Yes, please. Okay. Are we able to see the picture on this? Uh, yes. Thing? Yes, we can. I'll try and see if I can. Sorry, I can't seem to be moving it now. Hold on. Is that any better now? Yeah, the screen is bigger. At least we can see. Uh, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, let's try. Okay, I'm sorry about this. So no, that's okay. That's all right. I that's think okay. we've moved on to cataracts, which is quite a common condition, but unfortunately happens a bit sooner in patients who have diabetes. And as you know, cataracts can be anatomically described depending on where the cataracts are. Um, it, the, the 
the formation of the cataract can uh, happen quite quickly, particularly if the diabetic control is not very good. Usually, when a patient's diabetes is controlled quite well, then the refractive changes, which means uh, change in glasses, would also stabilize. So here are some examples of cataracts, and you can see very dense cataracts in both these eyes. And the, one of the cataracts is almost white. It makes the patient blind, and it's a very difficult situation to operate on as well. So here are some other examples of cataracts. In the slide to the left, you can actually see a foci of cataract at the posterior end of the eye, which is called as a posterior subcapsular cataract, which my ophthalmology colleagues would have seen quite a lot. And you can Ramesh. also have spikes of cataract, which is called as a Ramesh. cortical cataract. Yeah? Sorry, your, your slides are not forwarding. If you know, if you at the bottom, bottom um, of the slide of your presentation, yeah, right at the bottom right, you see the, the one that's got the, the negative, the plus and the negative. Um, Just, you see that that I can see. So bottom right, you've you've got a couple of icons there, and the one closest to the negative, the minus circle, is at the presentation. If you click onto that, that should go and open your presentation up to, um, uh, oh, to presenter sorry. screen yeah, okay. as opposed to your is slides. Any, can you see any movement on the slides now? No, it's not moving forward. I... Hmm. I'm sorry, I've got the arrows at the end of the slide presentation, but I can't see a plus or a minus, Anna. Um, so if you okay. move your more, do, do. can you move your arrow around the oh, screen sorry. so we can see them? Can you see the arrow around? No, maybe you're sharing the, the, the other screen. You know, when you go to share screen, yeah. If you click to share screen, does it give you some options of, of which screen to share? Um, yes, it did give me an option. I chose this uh, presentation as such. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering whether, uh, let me stop sharing again. Okay. Yeah, if you open the presentation and put it in your, um, so on your computer now, can you put it onto presentation mode? Okay, let me just try that. Yep, so it's in presentation mode now. Yeah, and now share your screen. That, that might then... Can you see a new set of slides at all by any chance? Uh, yes, uh, we can see them. Okay, it so doesn't move forward as you move forward. I think that's the only thing. Yeah, let me just see if I can. Can you see any of this? We can see a cataract slide. Um, oh, that's not the presentation I'm sharing, actually. I'm really sorry about this. I. No, that's okay. Let's see if I can. Anna, are you seeing anything at anything at the moment? So it's still on the the slides, um, not the presenting. Yeah. So now, if I just choose to say from current slide, it's not in. No, it's not showing presentation. Uh, okay. I can see on the screen right now is slide number nine. It looks like we see. 
And then on the right and left hand side, we see the, the slide in the, um, in the organizer mode, but the central slide is slide number nine, is the only thing we see. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm not really sure what's happening here. Okay. So, okay. Uh, sorry about this, but um, I can I can go on to my next presentation, which is, let's see if that works any better. Can you see anything different now? Yes, we can see the other slide. Okay, so, and this was the slightly more um, uh, presentation uh, looking at the back of the eye as such. And this, uh, this is probably going to discuss a few more of the retinal problems we see. So if you can see, uh, I'll probably just go through it. But before I start on to this problem, I was hoping to show you slightly different types of cataracts and how there is an association with glaucoma and sometimes you can have a stroke-like situation where patients can't move their eyes because of the diabetes. So just to summarize, diabetes can affect every part of the eye. And I would now like to move on to my specialism, which is the retina and uh, how it can affect the eye and so on. So um, as most of you would, have, would know, uh, the three important parameters affecting diabetic eye disease is the long-term blood sugar control, the blood pressure and cholesterol. And sometimes you can develop new blood vessels in the back of the eye and uh, the treatment to be considered at that stage is laser. And also you can have some leakage in the retina causing maculopathy. We were, prob we were treating maculopathy with laser in the past, but now there are quite a few other possibilities as such. Are you able to see the next slide now? Uh, Still on the first one. Uh, can you see current service provision in the UK? No. No. We see the title no. slides. That's it. We see the diabetic eye and then your name. Slide number one we see. Okay. I'm not really sure of... Um... Is there a way you can email it to... Um... Simon, maybe, and oh, now we see the current service provision in the UK. Yeah, okay. I had some luck here then. Okay, let's see if I can progress the slides and not bore you too much. So okay. th this is just the current service provision in the UK. And I know that this can be quite different from what we, we are used to in Zambia. So here we are quite lucky in that we have a diabetic retinopathy screening service. And we have quite a lot of opticians who are able to carry out uh, examination on patients. And we also get GPs to look at these patients and if the diabetic control is not very good, they refer patients on to the eye clinics. And of course they run diabetic clinics where they concentrate on patients who are pregnant and who have insulin pumps, et cetera. So these patients need specialist ophthalmology care. So I've moved on to the next slide. Is that visible now? Yeah, it's moving now. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we, can, we can see. Very good. So in the hospital eye services, we have diabetic uh, laser clinics, etc. And we also have ophthalmic photographic diabetic review and an optician led diabetic review clinic. And we also started doing an antivascular endothelial growth factor injection service, which is using drugs such as Lucentis and Ilia. We have an assessment clinic and we run injection clinics as well. So all of this has been established quite well in the last six to seven years. I wanted to go through one of the biggest studies called as the DRCR nut net study. And this is quite an important study, which is relevant to all ophthalmologists as such. And if anyone is interested in knowing what's happening with DRCR net, it's a, it's a publicly available resource and you can just Google it and you can go in and see what all studies are available for treatment of uh, diabetic patients and diabetic retinopathy. So just to go through, um, what this slide is relevant about. Initially, as you know, the treatment for diabetic maculopathy was just laser treatment, but then these new anti-VEGF uh, drugs such as Lucentis and Ilia became available. They had a study which looked at treatment of the eye with maculopathy with laser as well as an injection of an anti-VEGF, just laser and just the anti-VEGF and not laser. 
and they found that patients who had the injections into the eye did much better than patients who had laser as well as injection and just the laser itself. And this is a ground changing moment, which happened around 2013 to 2014, which has changed the way we treat diabetic patients as such. So the primary outcome uh, point was about after a year, and they found that patients who had uh, just the uh, sham or prompt laser treatment did the worst. And the patients who had the ranibizumab and the prompt laser, which is the Lucentis and the laser treatment did quite okay, but they were not as good as the patients who had just the injections. So this is a groundbreaking moment, which has changed the way we treat patients with diabetic eye disease. So moving on to the next slide, I'll go into a few more details, uh, detailed studies like the protocol T, uh, which was which compared all the uh, available anti-VEGF injections like Ilea, Avastin, which is used a lot in Zambia, Lucentis for diabetic macular edema. And what they identified is that a patient with the most severe type of eye disease who present with the worst maculopathy are usually helped much more by Ilea rather than any of the other anti-VEGF injections. So it's quite important that if you have a patient, if you had the choice of um, Lucentis, Ilea, Ivastin, et cetera, if a patient had very severe diabetic maculopathy to start with, then maybe Ilea would be the best drug to start with. Uh, but they found that if you use Lucentis and Ilea, the difference between both these drugs were the same after about a couple of years. So uh, there are several parts of the DRCR net study, and uh, the uh, like I described before, protocol I. They have different protocols in this, and the protocol I showed that um, using ranibizumab on itself instead of using it alongside laser gave the better results as such. So um, there are several different studies which looked at the use of um, several of these drugs. And uh, the RICE and RIGHT study looked at the use of uh, Lucentis, which is called as ranibizumab, on a regular basis. And they identified that wow. there was a good response to Lucentis injections over a three-year period. And they found that the, the, the response was maintained over a five-year period with reduced number of injections as well. So you can see that the, the best corrected visual acuity gain from baseline in the first year was over 12.5, which is significant. It's almost a three-line improvement in vision. And also they found that uh, the when they used a drug called Ilea in the Vivid and the Vista studies, they found that using it four weekly and eight weekly made no big difference. And therefore it was recommended that the Ilea drug was used at eight, week, eight weekly intervals. So coming back to uh, what is commonly used in uh, Zambia, Avastin, it's an excellent drug. And uh, there was this uh, GLADOF lecture, which was delivered in 2010 and published in 2011, which showed that uh, intravitreal bevacizumab, which is Avastin, um, had an improvement in almost all stages of diabetic retinopathy and maculopathy. And um, they improved the best corrected visual acuity, the structural changes which were seen in the OCT angiogram, et cetera. And also quite useful in treating patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It reduced the uh, complications such as neovascularization and macular edema. Uh, but one thing which was identified is that there was the chance of tractional retinal detachment appearing soon after the injection. And therefore, it was suggested that if a Vastin injection was going to be used in a patient who has um, a slightly more chance of developing tractional retinal attachment, that it was best done four days uh, before a surgery was planned. So in, in, the, in the UK, we don't use a Vastin a lot, plainly because it's a non-licensed drug. So the, the only reasons why we use a Vastin is if there is an indication outside the National Institute of Clinical Excellence criteria, which would be a vitreous hemorrhage, which is associated with an aggressive proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or if a patient presents with neovascular glaucoma, 
or does develop new blood vessels in the front or in the back of the eye from uh, something such as an ocular ischemic syndrome. So let's move on to uh, Ozidex, which is a, a steroid implant which we use to treat diabetic macular edema. And uh, so this is one of the approved drugs following the National Institute of Clinical Excellence's guidance. And um, it's recommended that we use this drug, particularly in pseudophagic patients who have had a cataract operation before. And one of the main reasons for that being that it does progress the cataract quite rapidly. The diabetic macular edema, if it has not responded to anti-VEGF, then it becomes uh, suitable for use uh, in patients uh, who can tolerate um, steroids. Obviously, you cannot use this drug in patients who have a history of glaucoma as it can make the glaucoma much worse. So when you use Ozidex, um, you need to warn the patient that they are going to see a floater, which will lie, which is likely to keep them company for a good three to four months. The drug can be effective for about four to six months as such, but it is critical that the intraocular pressure is monitored every two months. The injection of the implant can be repeated once every 16 weeks, once every four months. And sometimes if the macular edema has not resolved completely, then you can consider using an anti-VEGF top, top up, which here in the UK could be an ILEA or a Lucentis injection, but Avastin can also be used. So we also are lucky enough to have an Iluvian implant, which is a fluocinolone acetonide implant. And this is again a different type of steroid, which we use to treat chronic macular edema. Um, this was approved by NICE uh, in 2019. So each of these implants uh, can act up to uh, a period of three years, which is 36 months. Obviously, it has to be used in an eye which has had cataract operation, and it's allowed to be used in people who have not responded to Lucentis and ILEA therapy. Um, generally, if there is a reason why a patient cannot have an antivascular endothelial growth factor injection, such as if the patient's had a heart attack or a stroke within the last three months, then steroids are recommended, and the steroids can either be an Ozidex injection or an Iluvian injection. But then again, just like in patients who've had Ozidex injections, these patients need to have intraocular pressure monitoring done every three months. So if you do, if you, if you are in a scenario where we actually don't have Ozidex or um, Iluvian available, intravitreal triamcinolone can be used. It's not licensed for intraocular use. Primarily, uh, it, 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 it's used for um, intraarticular or joint injections, et cetera. But this was the first drug which was used uh, intraocularly before the advent of any of these drugs. Here in the UK, we use it for refractory cystoid macular edema, which happens after cataract operation, or cystoid macular edema, which is associated with posterior uveitis. There are different doses which people use, but I prefer to use two milligrams, which is 0 0.05 mil of the drug in the eye. And again, because it's a steroid, it's quite important that we monitor the eye pressure on a regular basis. The drug can have an effect for three to four months, but patient needs to be warned about quite a lot of black floaters in the vision as the drug is opaque. So I'd like to move on to uh, some really exciting developments in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy. As I mentioned before, we have Lucentis, we have Ilea, we can use Avastin, but all of these need to be repeated. Usually it's an injection which is done once every month and then done on a regular basis. Maybe on, a pay, on an average patient needing about seven to nine injections in a year. Whereas now they've developed a new drug uh, by a company called Genentech Roche. And this drug, um, it has a slightly different effect um, because it binds to a protein called angiopoietin-2 and also the vascular endothelial growth factor agent. And, as it, as, and because of its dual action, the drug obviously acts for much longer. So um, the, there's been a recent study which has looked at uh, treating uh, patients who have not had these injections before with two different doses of pericimab, six milligrams and 1.5 milligrams. And the other group had the regular Lucentis injections. 
And when they looked at the outcome of the patients who had these injections over a three year period, they found that the patients who had the ferricimab six milligrams did much, much better with an excellent gain of 13.9 letters as compared to Lucentis, which was just 10.3. Just looking back at several years, when we looked at the first studies, which where Lucentis was studied, 10.3 was an amazing result. But as compared to that, if you got another four letters, which is, uh, which is a fantastic gain, and, and particularly if you're able to achieve this with lesser number of injections, say about five in a year, that is an excellent result for the patient. So um, as a result, I mean, like we are hoping that ferricimab would probably be approved by National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the middle of next year and hoping that it would have a significant effect in the way we treat patients and the number of times patients require treatment as such. So um, you might have heard about another drug called as Beavu, and this is a drug which has been approved for use in wet macular degeneration uh, patients and it's an amazingly uh, effective drug, but unfortunately it's, um, it's associated with slightly increased intraocular inflammatory conditions such as retinal vasculitis, et cetera. So there's a two studies which are going on at the moment, Kestrel and Kite, looking at the use of this drug in patients with severe diabetic maculopathy. And they found that the results, the initial results state that they're they're comparable to ILEA, which is one of the better drugs to use in uh, diabetic maculopathy with better anatomical results and sustained visual acuity as well. Um, it means that the patients would require lesser injections, maybe one every three months, but unfortunately it is still associated with increased retinal vasculitis. So it will need more studying, et cetera, before the drug can be used widely. So I'd like to go on to the next generation drugs. So we're looking at uh, drugs, we've looked at drugs which can keep the condition under control, but the next generation of drugs like stem cell therapy are going to change how we treat patients. Uh, it will mean that we can reverse, we can not only uh, stop the condition from progressing, but also regress some of, reverse some of the visual loss which uh, patients uh, get because of either delayed treatment uh, or probably not picking up the condition uh, soon enough. So uh, as you can see, uh, this is a study which has looked at the uh, role of stem cell therapy, but uh, the drug which I've mentioned below, Regen XBO, um, is, a, is an amazing drug. And there's, an, there's a study which is going on looking at RGX3114 for treating diabetic retinopathy, but not patients who have uh, the maculopathy in the center and they found that the results are exceedingly good. So hopefully this is, these are drugs to watch out for the future. So in, 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 I'm just coming up to the summary right now. We can predict the outcomes much more accurately when patients present with diabetic maculopathy. The visual results are getting much better with the newer treatment. Anti-VEGF drugs are very, very effective, but as one would expect, they're extremely expensive. Just to give you an idea of what the drug prices were here in the UK, they started off at almost thousand pounds a shot, but now the drop the the prices are dropped around uh, less than four hundred pounds. It's still quite expensive if you have to treat a patient about ten to twelve times uh, in a year. And uh, the most important thing which we learned is that the retinopathy screening program has been very effective and has been very effective in picking up uh, eye disease much sooner than maybe about 10 years uh, ago. So um, just to summarize, in the short term, uh, we need these anti-VEGF drugs to stop uh, patients from losing vision. We also need to make sure there's an effective diabetes screening program. A long-term strategy would be to try and prevent diabetes and more importantly, people putting on weight we need to have other structures incorporated into the diabetic screening program by liaison psychiatry, availability of insulin pumps. Um, it realistically depends on what the health ministry and the government decides in any given country. Are they going to spend 10 million pounds a year on injecting patients repeatedly into the eye? 
or and deal with other diabetic com to complications like amputation of foot, um, stroke, heart attack issues like that, or to try and prevent diabetes and detect and control the condition effectively and early on. So that's the end of my presentation. I would probably stop sharing over here. I know that we have run uh, past my time. I'm so sorry that uh, you weren't able to see some of the uh, more glamorous slides I was meant to show you, but there you are. <laughs> well, wow, let's give uh, Dr. Sivaraja a big hand of uh, applause uh, and uh, for that um, uh, presentation and uh, for those slides, especially uh, for our teams uh, in Zambia, Dr. Misa is coming next and we can make them available. Um, uh, after this uh, session and please uh, if you've got patients uh, or relatives uh, that have got diabetes as we have heard uh, from Dr. Sivaraja it's very very important to advise them to be seen by the doctor and also to have a regular eye checkup it's very very uh, important uh, that they are seen because there are other complications that may come as a result of that and also for going forward as Dr. Sivaraj is saying I care for Zambia uh, we are drafting um, a document Dr. Ian Connor might mention that and uh, we'll be engaging uh, the new Don government in Zambia uh, we've already uh, gotten in touch with the government in Zambia and uh, we're forward uh, the trustees of I care for Zambia we'll see how best we can engage and uh, use the skills of uh, people like Sivaraj and other medical doctors that can help uh, Zambia and also insulin pumps and other things uh, if you know anywhere where we can get some of these things that we can uh, donate and help our hospitals in Zambia uh, that would be much much appreciated leaflets and other things uh, so we appreciate so much uh, dr Svaraj, uh, for your time and this uh, wonderful presentation uh, now let's go to ndola uh, zambia uh, dr misa fungika she's uh, uh, one of uh, the ophthalmologists uh, in zambia whom we've worked closely since we started going to zambia and uh, later on uh, uh, morissa will be presenting something uh, 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 to that effect. Uh, let's cross over to Ndola and uh, listen to Dr. Misa Funjika briefly. Um, Misa, if you are able to, are you able to come on camera? Uh, if you can unmute. Yes, I think my camera is on. Uh, oh, yes. Are you able to okay. hear me? Uh, yes, uh, we are able to, uh, to hear you and uh, we'll just uh, spotlight. Uh, let's cross over to Ndola. Yes, Dr. Misa. Thank yes, you so yeah, yeah. much, uh, Simon. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, I'm Misa Fungika. I'm an ophthalmologist uh, based in Indola. So basically, I think uh, I will just give a brief overview of eye health in Zambia. I don't have a prepared presentation because I think when we we're discussing with Simon, he just encouraged me to just talk about my experience in Zambia and just one or two things of what we do in Zambia. So basically, um, from the presentation that Simon gave, as well as what uh, Dr. Anna gave, so much has happened, or oh, there's been a lot of development in eye care in Zambia over the last five to six years. I think uh, when uh, eye, health for, eye care for Zambia started coming to our country, we we're around uh, 20, 25 ophthalmologists in the country. But over the last five years, we've had about five new ophthalmologists joining us. And this still is a very big gap. The few number of ophthalmologists that we have, most of us are, are found in the major cities in the country, most are in the capital city, Lusaka, I'm on the Copper Belt, some are in the other provincial capitals in the Copper Belt, like Kitwe and the big cities. We still have a gap where some provinces still don't have ophthalmologists, as well as some towns still don't have ophthalmologists. So we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, what I can say is that uh, in the last four years, we have uh, a new pr uh, program called the Specialist Training Program, where, which was spearheaded by the Ministry of Health. And the aim of this program was to increase the number of specialists in the country. And I think uh, as ophthalmology field in Zambia, we received a boost because I think in the first year alone, 
we had about 11 doctors that entered into this program. And I'm glad to say today that they'll be sitting for their final exam in the next one week. And should they all pass, we'll have 11 new ophthalmologists joining the field. And this will be a real boost to the profession of ophthalmology in Zambia. So the challenge we've had in the past is that most of us were trained outside the country, but I think from around 2014, 2015, we've strengthened the local training in Zambia. And this is what has helped bridge the gap of human resource in our country. So the, when we go to sub or super specializations, I think we are still way, way behind uh, regarding sub specializations. Uh, we have two retinal surgeons within the country, one in government, one working in the private sector. We have one uh, neuro ophthalmologist who's working in a faith based uh, hospital as well. And then we only have about two pediatric ophthalmologists. Most of us are general ophthalmologists who try to do what we can in the different, uh, to attend to the different patients that we have. Aside from the ophthalmologists, we have mid-level cadres who include the ophthalmic nurses as well as the clinical officers. And the aim of promoting the training of ophthalmic nurses and clinical officers is that we can, is to, is it spread our wings to reach as many people as we can in the country because I think the number of specialist doctors alone is not enough. So most of the eye health services in our country are provided in the government facilities. But we, now we have seen an increase in number of private facilities coming up in Zambia, as well as a few uh, church-based uh, hospitals that offer high care to the people of Zambia. But majority or more than 80% of us are working in the government sector. What are the common eye conditions that we see? So I think uh, most of the conditions that we see are not very different from what you see that side in Europe. It's mostly the conjunctivitis. We have uh, mostly allergic conjunctivitis, infections, some corneal ulcers, and then glaucoma, uh, cataract, which is the commonest cause of uh, avoid, uh, reversible blindness in Zambia. And then with an increase in the number of diabetic patients, we are getting to see a lot of uh, diabetic retinopathy. And unfortunately, most of it's some, of, some patients are losing sight because uh, of coming late to the hospital. Refractive errors as presented by Anna are also a challenge, but I'm glad to encourage school screening so that we're able to identify and pick up some refractive errors in Zambia. But I think it's still on a very, very low scale. And we are, we are, we're still uh, way, I think more than 10 years behind before we can actually examine every child to, to pick up the refractive errors before they reach probably grade two of school. So uh, when you look at um, infrastructure, our country has five centers of excellency. And as I said, most of the centers of excellency are along the major cities. I think Lusaka, Ndola, where I'm based, we have Kitwe on the Copper Belt, Kitwe Teaching Hospital, one in the southern part of Zambia and one in the eastern part. And the reason why we have so few centers of excellence is because I think we've been very few, there's very few trained manpower, but I'm hoping as more people are trained to serve uh, the population of Zambia. So what we've, what we've aimed to do, I think, uh, is that every district should at least have one is it eye nurse or eye clinical officer who will be able to identify the basic ophthalmic conditions and then refer to the main uh, to the major provincial centers where we are located? But then this again brings in the challenges of transport, brings in the challenges of money and just finances for them to be able to come to the hospital. So I think uh, for as long as we don't have that many specialists in the country, it is, uh, achieving eye health for all still remains a challenge. On the aspect of equipment, I think uh, we are not too bad. Most of the centers of excellence have the basic slit lamp that we are able to use. We have the ophthalmoscopes, the indirect ophthalmoscopes, 
and uh, we are able to do lasers for some of the diabetic patients. So the major challenges that we have, I think, is in the uh, area of servicing and keeping the equipment working because we have very few biomedical people that are trained to attend to, to, to service eye health equipment. And then also procurement of consumables for surgeries, as well as consumables to, to keep, keep using some of the equipment that we have, for example, the tunnel pens. Some of them will need the probes, which are not that easily available. Uh, I think by and wise, the basic equipment we have available, but the challenge is to keep it working as well as to provide surgeries for the people that we have in our country. So what are some of the areas for support, like in my view? I think the most important is, uh, as I've said, we have very few specialists that are able to offer training. For me, I'm in Indola. I think for the past four, five years that I've been here, I've been, I've, I've been alone in the government sector, supported by two ophthalmologists in private sector who support me to be able to train the, the residents that we have in Indola. So I think uh, the time that uh, Simon came to Zambia together with Dr. Rusa, we were privileged to have an oculoplastic surgeon with us and we could book uh, oculoplastic patients and were able to operate with them and would learn from, uh, I think Dr. Rusa at the time that he came with uh, the team, uh, Simon from the UK. So those are some of the uh, partnerships that we would want to see grow. It's unfortunate that COVID-19 has uh, reduced the number of trips of uh, the team coming to Zambia. But I think uh, even through Ian, via Zoom, we've been able to learn, he's been able to teach refractions and some um, uh, optics uh, to, to our students and residents. And I think this has been very helpful because I think once in a while, sometimes we get so overwhelmed that we do not spend enough time with the residents. But I think your support in helping us to teach is something that that area for support, I think uh, is uh, equipment and charts, not very, big equipment, sometimes even visual acuity charts, near, near vision acuity charts, the Amsler's grids, the color vision testing kits, just small, small things that make a difference, I think, are some of the things that we would really appreciate to be supported with. And then uh, surgical instruments are also a challenge. And I think sometimes ophthalmic equipment is, that, is not that readily available because one, the market for most suppliers and vendors is not so big. So very few of them would stock such products for us to be able to buy easily. So most of the time would have to import directly from either India or China or depend on donations that I think um, also probably training of biomedical. We have a college that trains biomedical technicians, but most of them are not exposed to eye health equipment. So you find that they, they are not very com competent in uh, repairing some of the instruments that we have. I think all in all, that is all, that is the, the small, small introduction, uh, uh, presentation that I would give regarding uh, eye health in Zambia. If uh, people need clarifications, I think I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Misa, uh, for, uh, for that. Let's give Misa uh, a big hand. Uh, we, uh, uh, we can hear a uh, heart and passionate in the work that they have been doing in Zambia. And uh, for the IKEA team, uh, I think we're going to tweak the program uh, around Misa while they are still on the camera uh, just for the next few minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Morris is here uh, all the way from uh, Belgium and uh we just want to do something and i've got helen there on the camera i know i've uh, gotten her on the spot uh miss afunjika if you can uh, stick around uh, briefly uh morris wants just to do uh to present something uh to you uh, are you able to hear us misa yes i am i'm able to follow thank you Okay, if you can uh, just uh, stay there, uh, Maurice has got uh, something and uh, Helen uh, will tell us uh, whether something uh, is on the way or uh, still somewhere uh, in the UK. Over to you, Maurice, where are you? Our team is growing and we've got our friends uh, who have come to uh, partner with IKEA for Zambia in Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, we are growing. Uh, let's go to Maurice. Uh, Maurice, uh, yes, over to you.
Thank you, Simon. And actually, you know, for the sake of time, I, I, I will refer from the slides. I'm sure, Simon, you can share the slides later with the team, maybe. And I will just keep it to the words. But it's all right. There you go. Share them for me. Perfect. Um, let me let me talk about this and, and maybe you go to the next slide. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about a brief journey is um, how do I got to this team? Uh, very simple. I retired fairly early. Um, and I was talking to my dear wife and um, previously had been involved in a um, World Health Organization activity uh, to stop tuberculosis in Zimbabwe, which was a great experience. And my wife said, well, actually, go and talk to my uncle, Uncle Ian. And Uncle Ian Corner um, introduced me and said, Lawrence, we can use your help. I wanted to make a connection with, um, with charity. And, and Ian introduced me to I Care for Zambia. Uh, obviously, he was immediately very excited about that. And uh, particularly, I was very excited about the fact that we were having a prospective trip to Zambia in 2021 or 2020 February. Um, so, Anna, thanks to your story, I'm now even more eager to go and to see Zambia with my team. Um, when I got into the journey, I fairly quickly reached out to a friend of mine who is a, um, uh, an eye doctor, in, an eye specialist in, in the eye care hospital in Rotterdam. Um, Dr. Van Riven, he's a very dear friend of mine and several other of my friends, a pharmacist and, and some other friends. And they said, we all want to help. How do we can help, you know, with skills, with machines, with pharmaceuticals, etc." cetera. Um, so we were very keen to go and literally actually to the point of, I had the screen open on the KLM page to book my trip to Zambia, to click book now, book now. And of course, then unfortunately COVID prevented us from doing that book now button um, and we couldn't go, but I'm really looking forward to go for the trip. But we didn't have the trip. And then we said, well, what do we do? Do we feel sorry for ourselves? Do we feel sorry for the people in Zambia? Or do we do something different? And luckily, um, Dr. Riven actually said, well, we can do something different. And if you go to the next slide, um, he said, we have got a machine in our hospital that is no longer used as much as it should be used, um, but we can donate to Zambia. So we said, okay, what is it? And he said, well, I've got a FACO machine in, um, in, in, in our hospital that I'm happy to donate. And we can, if you can somehow get it to Zambia, we're more than happy to donate it and, um, and, and offer it to use in Zambia. Um, so with the story, what we did is I packed it up. I put it in a car from Rotterdam. I drove it to Belgium. I put it in my garage. Then I planned a trip to go and see my parents-in-law because I know Ian was coming to, um, to Plymouth to be able to pick it up. So I shoved everything in my car with all the accessories. We got it into Plymouth. Ian put it in his car in several trips to get it to, I, I believe, Birmingham, where then went on the container that you see there on a pallet. And now it's somewhere on the way to, to, um, to Zambia. Um, obviously, one of the things that... I was talking recently with, with uh, Dr. Van Riven recently. I said, listen, you know, he's really concerned. How do we make sure the machine, when it gets there, how do we set it up? How do we make sure that um, uh, everybody can um, uh, know how to operate it? And, and you know, we can, we can actually make sure that it works. And that importantly as well, we can actually make sure it, it gets maintained in the right way and the people get the right support um, to make sure that it's worked and, and used to the better way. Um, so we're very pleased, if you go to the final slide, um, Simon, really pleased to be able to donate this trip uh, or this, this machine. Obviously, thanks to the help of the eye care uh, hospital in Rotterdam and the Franciscus Hospital in the Netherlands, um, both have donated this machine. And obviously, of, of course, thanks to the help of Dr. Van Riven, who's there, who's, by the way, really keen to as well join me in the coming trip to go there, to help operate, to help do you know, assessments, um, and actually, I made a little list, Simon, as we had this, this, um, this chat tonight of other thoughts that come to mind, which I'll drop separately to you, of things that we can do to raise money, to raise materials, to raise other expertise to get to Zambia, because I think we've got a great cause here that we need to drive. Thank you. So, Moritas is uh, presenting that uh, machine uh, uh, to you, uh, but uh, let's uh, have uh, uh, Helen. You can unmute uh, Helen uh, this, uh, the, from... Uh, uh, National Police uh, Aid Convoy, and uh, let's uh, hear Helen. Uh, uh, is the machine in the UK or is the machine uh, gone? Uh, uh, where is it uh, as we present it uh, 
uh, officially and then it will be handed uh, over. Yes, Helen, over to you. Hello. Uh, yes, um, I've just been quickly looking at the calendar. I think it was loaded into our, onto our container on that picture in about the middle of October. I can't remember the exact date because it's on my computer and obviously I'm looking at this at the moment. Um, and we're expecting it to arrive at uh, Dar es Salaam on the 6th of December. So then it has to get from there across to uh, Lusaka, which can take um, uh, up to three weeks on average sort of thing. So we're, we're sort of looking maybe at the end of December, Christmas Day, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's Helen uh, from uh, Convoy and how pieces have been falling together. Uh, excellent. It, excellent. It's excellent. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Misa Fungika, as uh, Maurice said, uh, uh, the FECO machine, uh, we are donating it uh, to Ndola Central Hospital and uh, it's all yours for the hospital and uh, Morris and uh, the doctor in Netherlands uh, will arrange if you need uh, Zoom teachings or sessions uh, uh, for people that uh, are going to operate that machine. Uh, that is a very, very powerful uh, machine and a very, very expensive uh, machine that uh, can be used uh, in theatre. It's a multi uh, function, I'm sure, Sivaraj and others uh, and uh, Dr. Anna uh, uh, they have used uh, these machines, uh, they can tell us, uh, but uh, we are here just to say we have donated that machine uh, to Ndola Central uh, Hospital. Uh, so it will be arriving in Zambia, as Helen has mentioned, uh, they are from a, a police convoy and um, uh, ensuring uh, that uh, the goods that uh, we have sent uh, uh, will get uh, into Zambia. So we are so grateful and thankful to uh, to everyone uh, who has been part of uh, this journey. Morris and uh, the team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so this machine uh, is going to Ndola uh, Central Hospital so they can see patients and that they can operate uh, on patients and make sure that uh, somebody is helped. Uh, it's a very wonderful machine. I'm sure Dr. Sivaraji has used this. It's a multi, uh, multi uh, purpose uh, uh, FECO machine. Uh, uh, honestly, we could not afford as trustees of eye care for Zambia to buy such a, a very uh, uh, expensive machine, but uh, it has been given to us, as uh, Morris was saying, and it's been shipped by uh, police, uh, National Police Convoy uh, UK, which is a charity. They transport uh, and uh, charitable goods uh, to different countries, uh, and we've been working with them the last few years. As she says, it's on the container. A few more days, uh, it, on the 6th of December, uh, the container will be at Del Islam and a few uh, weeks uh, from there, uh, it has the container will be getting to Lusaka. So more details uh, as uh, uh, to get it from Lusaka, the all details uh, will be passed on uh, to Ndola Central Hospital. So Misa, we are happy to uh, to hand over uh, that machine uh, to Ndola Central Hospital uh, free of charge. And uh, we just want you to use it uh, to help uh, Zambian people and treat eyes uh, uh, in Zambia. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I know we've gone past time, uh, but uh, we've got um, uh, Ian, we've got two Ians uh, and Sharon. Sharon um, uh, was supposed to uh, to present something and uh, uh, Ian there. Uh, let's uh, go to Sharon. Uh, you uh, 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 was in Zambia as well, a uh, nanny uh, medical uh, but she worked um, as a volunteer. Uh, to, she's a retired teacher. That's why we are saying uh, anybody is uh, welcome to come along and get to see what happens in Zambia. How can we help this uh, great and noble cause uh, in Zambia? Uh, if you hear a dog barking in the back there, it's not from me. It's Ian and Sharon. Uh, Sharon, uh, please tell us what was your experience uh, in Zambia as we begin to be winding up uh, and thereafter uh, Ian Collins uh, will uh, wrap it up uh, for us. Uh, apologies, uh, we've gone beyond uh, that time. Uh, Sharon and uh, uh, Ian, uh, Ian is one of the trustees uh, of I Care for Zambia Charity and Sharon, uh, she volunteered on our last trip when we went to Zambia. Yes, uh, Sharon, what was your experience in Zambia? Thank you, Simon, for giving me this opportunity to have you volunteered and helped. 
Um, I sat in the outpatients at Heartlands one day thinking, why is Ian taking so long? Is it so long? <laughs> when he came out, he was beaming, he was followed by you. And on the way home, Ian explained the conversation and it then became clear that he was going to be going to Africa. I thought, fine, a few days without him, no problem. Then it became obvious it was a bit more than just Ian going to Africa. He was going to be doing something important, which I think he has. Um, so I, eventually I got to the stage and I thought, well, I've been to Africa, I like Africa. If he's going, why can't I go with him? I put that point forward and said, well, I have to check with Simon, I'm not sure. And you said, yes, no problem, no problem, that was great. From then on, it has just been fantastic. I've met some fabulous people, you, your wife, Beata, your children, all the people in Zambia, Anna and her family, and Anne's always, always collected additional family members. So we've got adopted sons, daughters all over the place. We just go, oh, they're, they're family. Well, they're not really, but they are. And I think all of you are now part of our family. Having said that, got to Zambia, didn't know what I was going to do. I said I could do the cleaning, do the washing, do some cooking. None of it was needed. Everything like that was done for me. So went along to the clinic the first day. I found seats for people. I stood in the sun, trying to keep the sun off them because it was so hot. <laughs> and at the end of two weeks, I had some fantastic friends. I'll mention Auntie Doris and Cousin Wendy. Cousin Wendy, no, she was the referee Wendy, who challenged me, bearing in mind I was 66 at the time, challenged me to a race. <laughs> and I thought, that sure win. <laughs> and... We had a fantastic time. I met some incredible people. There were some highs and there were some lows. One or two lows were quite difficult and most of us ended up in tears, mainly because there were patients whose conditions could not be improved upon. Not going any further than that. There were Occasions when I burst into fits of laughter. Uh, there's only one person who will know. You, you know about old ladies getting stuck in the lavatory. Well, the said. <laughs> I'll be a phone with you at all times is what I'm told. It wasn't me. <laughs> and given that, I kept thinking, well, where's this person gone? Why aren't they? I know, I can crawl onto their table, steal a few more bits of paper to put information on because I'd run out of paper that day. And every second longer that nobody came back, I'm going to get, get some more, get some more, get some more. And on our final day, we went shopping, wandering down the, into Lusaka, into the town centre, into the Mal, as they call them. And then suddenly we heard this man shouting. We all stood still and thought, what's going on? A uh, gentleman turned up, followed by a younger member of the family on a bicycle. So he run. But, uh, how old are you? How old are you? All of us we were all you know, of an age. And then finally he said, I'm 80. Thank you. And he said, thank you, because he had never seen a photograph of himself. Because we'd taken his photo, he'd come up and asked, could I have a copy of it? So Ian had printed one off and all of it. And he'd never seen a photograph of himself. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a good looking man. <laughs> <Wow. head. laughs> so that, that's one of my best memories of the whole place. It was incredibly hard work and incredibly worthwhile and enjoyable. Thank you, Simon.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sharon. Uh, Sharon, uh, she helped us uh, do the recordings uh, of patients, uh, get some information and all that. Uh, and because you are together in the same room, and Ian, uh, 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 one of our trustees, and then Ian Collins will uh, wrap it up. Uh, what next, uh, Ian Connor? You, uh, uh, Ian, me, I'm just an organizer and doing all these other bits. Uh, sometimes I wonder how and how we get to do some of these things. Uh, but uh, yeah, Ian is a man uh, behind um, technical stuff and work, and he is uh, one of our trustees in I Care for Zambia. He does much of the writings. Uh, right now, he's working on a document uh, that we are going to submit to the Zambian government, uh, Minister of Health. We've already made uh, uh, the appointment uh, uh, with uh, uh, the people there, the Minister of uh, Health. Uh, Ian, what next for I Care for Zambia, in a nutshell, uh, briefly, as we are winding up? I think your sound is a little bit, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Sharon was a bit clear. Yeah, if you speak loud, maybe. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so that's on. That might be better. That's better. That's better. Good. Um, we need two enablers. One is um, this Omicron issue to be resolved. Yeah, so this variant. We, yeah. We could travel to Zambia. The other thing is we need to raise funds. These enable, are going to enable us to do what we think, um, what our plans are. But our plans really involve, I think, um, three areas. One is to do more, but doing more is linear. We go 900 one year, 900 the next, 900 the year afterwards. To do more than that, we need to do training and teaching so that Zambians themselves can do as much work as possible so that we can transfer the skills and more can happen that way. Yeah. That's important. That gives us a geometric progression rather than a linear one. Yeah. Now, the other thing that we need to do is to record. We need to not only do it, we need to have continuity. When we go next year, we need to know what we did this year and so on. And what we did the year before, we need to see people moving from one condition to another. And that needs recording. Um, as you noticed, uh, Anna mentioned that um, uh, Sharon and I did the recording um, when we were last there. That involved me spending a weekend, and I'll ask everybody to note this, only a weekend, customizing an old uh, contact management software system in order to have a patient record system for the charity. Um, what I want is a, uh, a national patient record system for eye care. Um, I've talked to people about it. I've talked to my oldest son who's in pharmaceuticals. I've talked to doctors and they all say it's too big. It's too big. You can't do that. You can't get a complete patient record system together. There are loads of companies all around the world trying to do one. Um, except, of course, that we had a, quite a simple one, but I care for Zambia developed over one weekend. Uh, I'll show you a print out of this. You won't be able to read it much, but there is the record for one patient. That patient has their photograph there. That photograph is an attached image. I'm not doing this uh, using software. There we are. You see that person's actually got a sheet of paper in front of them. Yeah. <laughs> that is an average Zambian patient record. Mm. Uh, they, if, if they lose it, if it gets wet, it gets burned, it's not there next year. Um, more teaching, more training, more recording. We need this recorded. I am in the process of talking to a company. Can I tell you a story? Um, first of all, um, about three years ago, I read an article um, uh, on the internet um, in a magazine, Digitalist magazine, organized and published by SAP. And it was called Elephants on the Balance Sheet, but a company um, created by some professors in Johannesburg uh, University who wanted to develop their company uh, in order to support their revenue, uh, their, their, um, their, their department. They created a company, very successful, um, two and a half thousand employees uh, in 25 countries, turning over 25, 250 uh, million a year. Um, 
their employees wanted more, they wanted purpose. So they split the company into three, um, the revenue earning element, the next part they called elephants, rhinos and people, or ERP, not end of life resource planning, but elephants, rhinos and people. And the other created a financial um, uh, company to support. They used their technology, which was um, satellite monitoring and zone um, photography to monitor elephants, rhinos, and other uh, insignificant animals in the wild. Um, they used the money to buy land off um, uh, white farmers and give it back to the indigenous people. They then discovered that if they could monitor elephants, rhinos, and other significant wild animals in the wild, they could also monitor expensive racehorses, um, expensive stock, and anything else they really liked. And they had another revenue earning um, business. It's where good work can create new business. So I've been looking for some organization to do that for us in terms of um, patient records. I'm in touch with SAP themselves or a, a significant project manager there. Um, we're on hold at the moment because of, um, of COVID, uh, but that organization has um, a program called A Billion Lives. And what I would like is an organization, perhaps them, perhaps another one, just to take what we've got for Eye Care for Zambia, which is a very simple, very basic uh, patient record system, um, and translate that uh, into something that we can use on the cloud. Because I think most Zambian families or villages have got a smartphone. With a smartphone, you're going to have encrypted um, communications, end-to-end -end encrypted, with data stored in the cloud. And I think that's an ideal platform. Uh, where you can use PIN numbers for individuals, the data stored in the cloud, you can take your phone to a doctor and they can fill it in and you've actually got the data there and it's stored and it's safe. Um, maybe pie in the sky, but uh, if they could do it for eye care for Zambia and for eye care in general in Zambia, it would take too much more to do a little bit for um, uh, ear, nose and throat, dentistry, um, antenatal care, neonatal care, uh, and use some metadata to um, actually bind that together, to use, create medical records as sheets of paper and bind them together in a book. Um, I think there's feasibility in that. Um, and I want to, this company to uh, actually do it free of charge for ICARE for Zambia. And then they've got a business that they can go and sell to the rest of the world. Wow. So anyway, um, more teaching, more training for a, a geometrical progression in the work that gets done, more linear work, um, but also more recording as well. That's where I see things moving in order for us to make a bigger contribution than we are now, to move on. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Ian. Yeah, let's give Ian a big hand. Uh, are you planning to build an infrastructure in Zambia or are you just uh, going to go and live uh, in uh, some lovely hotel there? What do you think? <laughs> oh, nice hotel would be fine. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, we've got a plan uh, to put up a center in Zambia and uh, put uh, uh, the hospital there. As Anna mentioned, as trustees, we are working on that. We want to uh, do uh, a project uh, in Zambia where we can have a permanent fr uh, infrastructure. Uh, put a hospital there, put a theater there, and the library and a center where we can train people and just um, help other people uh, so they can multiply ourselves. Uh, and then when we are not there, people can carry on with uh, uh, with work. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ian and everybody. Thank you. And as we wrap it up, uh, we've got now Ian Collins as we end uh, the session. I think Misa uh, was uh, briefly uh, uh, cut off. Uh, Misa, are you back? Yes, I am. I'm back. Sorry, I had an interrupt, uh, interruption with my internet. Internet. Um, but, okay. Hopefully, did you hear when Morris uh, presented the FECO machine? Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Yes, I got most of it though towards the end I got cut off. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now uh, uh, that's uh, fine. Now uh, we will uh, we will definitely uh, recap with you after uh, this session. Uh, uh, I care for Zambia and uh, our colleagues and friends in Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, we've uh, just uh, donated uh, uh, this FECO machine to you uh, on behalf of Undola Central Hospital and uh, Helene who works with a charity that helps us to transport. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So this is yours for Ndola Central Hospital and all the patients that you see this is for free. You're not going to pay anything. And uh, this is for Ndola Central Hospital and uh, their accessories uh, and uh, other things that uh, uh, are coming. It's arriving in Dal Islam, I think, on the 6th of December. And a few uh, weeks, uh, the container should be in Lusaka. We'll provide all the details for Ndola Central Hospital uh, to collect the machine and all the accessories. Uh, all yours for Ndola Central Hospital. I think she's having some challenge with uh, with the internet uh, uh, there, but uh, uh, we will we'll definitely um, uh, get in touch and provide all the details uh, with um, with that. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Simon. The most important thing, of course, is if they need help with setting it up or they need to contact the staff, let us know. We're there to help them online or via Zoom meeting, because it would be a shame they wouldn't be able to use the machine. So, Dr. Nisa, reach out if you need any help with the machine, please. Thank you. Thank you. So Maurice and the team uh, and everybody, uh, they'll be able to uh, to help, especially with the setting it up uh, and uh, everything. So as we conclude tonight's uh, uh, session, uh, there is COVID and now there is Imcron uh, 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 variant, which is coming. Uh, how are we going? Are we going to stop uh, or what we are doing, Ian? What do you think? What should we do? Uh, what should we be doing in between as governments uh, and the politics and the virus uh, uh, be sorted out? Uh, yes, in the next just few minutes as you wind up today. Uh, what, um, uh, what, uh, what are your views? Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I realise that we're running a little bit late, so I will try and be brief. First of all, congratulations, Murray. It's a most incredible uh, project. This must have taken some real driving along, I know, because I did something similar for a colleague in Nigeria. Well done. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm an optometrist. I spent uh, the last few hundred years uh, doing refractions and uh, when I retired uh, then I was, I've been teaching optometry at City University and I have visited a few, uh, quite a few African countries. I was actually in uh, Zambia uh, at uh, UTH Lusaka many years ago and um, uh, Dr. Anna took me back to uh, how interesting and wonderful it was to work in uh, quite dubious uh, situations uh, on occasions. Um, right, now, uh, my main area was dealing with refractions. Now, refraction, refractive error is actually, believe it or not, the second main cause of blindness in the world after cataracts. And compared to medical and surgical treatments it's quite a relatively easy ride and, and it's a fairly quick fix um, my job is to teach people how to actually carry out refractions now since covid came in uh, my visits to uh, africa uh, and african countries have stopped uh, and i decided that we're, we're not just going to sit there and do nothing we can extend this by using zoom we can get the theory across using Zoom quite nicely. It's very, very accessible for anybody, anywhere, anywhere in the country, anyone with a connection can uh, log on to this and they can get some benefit and also other countries as well. It's very cost effective. There are no costs involved. Um, <clears throat> I can set up various levels of courses ranging from uh, uh, outreach based uh, 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 triage systems where we can just see uh, uh, separating the blind from the seeing and working out what they're needing up to the, the more advanced full spherosal refractions. So anything is possible. I have about three or four different uh, 
uh, schemes that have actually developed, uh, have actually delivered some to, uh, to Zambia already, and I think they've been fairly successful. Now, how does it work? Well, if one refractionist works full time, let's say that person does eight a day, eight refractions a day, which is not a lot, five day a week, 40 a week, and over, let's say, 48 weeks in the year, this is almost 2,000 refractions. One person can be the mainstay for providing eye care for uh, 2,000 people over the year. As regards to supply of glasses, um, we're getting into a bit of a minefield here. A quick and easy fix for me is to do uh, spherical refractions using purely spherical glasses. In other words, we're not eliminating uh, people with astigmatism, but even astigmats can do remarkably well sometimes with just plain ordinary spherical glasses. These spherical glasses can be bought in very cheaply from uh, uh, the other side of the world for next to nothing. At one time, um, it was just plus lenses, low plus up to about plus six or seven that you could get. I have actually sourced somewhere in China where it's now possible to do ready-made specs for myopes, up to about minus six, which is the most major step forward. So the, the benefits of working online are, are, are fairly obvious. There are some limitations. Now, there's the obvious limitations connected with the internet. You need a good connection. Students have to have laptops and tablets and desktops. Phones do not work because the screen is not big enough and the connection is never very good. Uh, also, a small point, but dealing with the internet, you have to have a paid subscription because uh, the free subscriptions over Zoom are only 40 minutes, which is no good at all. Now, the big drawback for me is that certain types of online uh, tuition require a follow-up, a practical follow-up, uh, a face-to-face -face tuition system. That can only be done by local people who are in a position to... Uh, lecture on what they know best. Uh, so that, that is a, a factor. Now the planning, the actual planning and implementation of a course, we need to have a reliable contact person on site who's got access to both the recipients of the course and also the lecturers. Local internet is poor. So my suggestion, what I've evolved um, is if we need to contact somebody, uh, I'm, I'm based in London, I'm sorry, I should have said that originally. If I need to contact somebody, I will send them a text. Everybody has phones. So the text will say, I've sent you an email, and that will alert them because people don't actually look at their emails half as frequently as they look at the phones. And you need to agree the method of communication with uh, the person that you're dealing with. It's important to confirm the exact purpose of the proposed Zoom meeting. Is it going to be administrative? Is it going to be planning? Or is it going to be just teaching? If it's teaching, who are we teaching? Who What are the recipients? It could be nurses, it could be OCOs, it could be optometrists, it could be doctors, it could be surgeons. The other thing is, if we're working online, do we need to have any equipment for demonstration uh, at either end? Um, the course organisers will want to will have a good idea what topics they would want to have covered, but it's a good idea to provide the topics that you have available to them, and also to ask the actual uh, students themselves, the recipients, what do they want to hear. If you're working online, I think it's quite a good thing to have uh, handouts available or to give people uh, links for, for the internet. And finally, to, uh, to set up a provisional date and time. That in itself is a fine art, arranging so many people to be in the same place at the same time. Now, <clears throat> I had a few problems at first because I wasn't too familiar with um, uh, Zoom and 
I went through what Ramesh went through this evening. Uh, I went. I learned the hard way about screen sharing. It's quite important. I would suggest that you you do need to know about this yourself and uh, get yourself organised with the, how you're going to have the screen sharing. The next thing is the publicity. You need to send out in advance as many details as you can, a good few weeks ahead, a couple of months, weeks ahead. One week beforehand, send out the Zoom link, and then again, two or three days beforehand, repeat the Zoom link. With the instructions, we want you to log in five or ten minutes before your starting time so that we can have a nice prompt start. And of course, you mute everybody and you can accept questions later. Um, now, future developments, future developments. Now, there's a lot of fuss being made in England about collecting old glasses and sending them out to, um, uh, to places in Africa. I'm not a fan of this because people will give away their used glasses. These glasses have already had a life and they've got a limited future. If they break, there's very often no way forward. I'm not in favour of recycled glasses. The best thing is if, if uh, people send you recycled glasses, there are ways in which they can actually be broken down for scrap value and the metal uh, can provide a, quite a good income. Now, the other big thing is that I would suggest a good way forward for a very basic refraction service is to have uh, uh, some fairly low key workers to do refractions using what's called flippers. These are little plastic frames with a pair of lenses in, equal pairs, pair of plus 050s, plus 1s, plus 3s, plus 4. And then that way you can say, is this better or worse? Then you try another one on top. You can arrive at an approximate binocular refraction. <clears throat> Now, the, the idea of this is that you're going to give people ready-made specs. Now, please don't think I am anti-astigmatism and I don't like cylinders because obviously that's the way forward. But I'm thinking a quick, easy method. It's easy to teach, easy to implement, not very expensive because all you need is a set of flippers, a letter chart and uh, a large supply of ready-made specs. That, I think, is a good way forward. Once you have this in place, then this is a good way for, for working in, um, in the interior and in the outreach operations. If you're working in the hospitals, universities, clinics, then, of course, we will teach the full uh, spherical refraction so that people are then capable of dealing with uh, full and exact and precise prescriptions. Really, I think that's about all I've got to say. If anybody uh, wants to contact me, please do so through Simon. Thank you, everybody. I've lost sound. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we are just coming to the end of our session, uh, but uh, uh, there's some uh, comments uh, in the chat. And uh, as we were saying, uh, Miss has just responded. Uh, our internet keeps uh, on and off. Uh, Miss, uh, did you want to say something? Uh, uh, and I'm sure the doctors, uh, you might have seen uh, the questions in the chat. I apologize, uh, please, uh, for uh, it's been a compacted uh, 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 session. But uh, in the future, we'll make sure we make uh, more time uh, for different courses, especially. Uh, in terms of eyes, how we can help as we work hand in hand with uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, especially uh, in Zambia. Yes, Misa, did you want to say something? Yes, I just want to say a very big thank you for the FECO machine. This will be the first FECO machine, and I never imagined I would, I would have a FECO machine at Indola because I think my registrars are joined into the meeting. They would ask me, Doc, when are we going to start doing FECO? And I could never give an answer, but I'm so humbled. I'm so grateful. Well, I, I just, I have no words to express my gratitude. So, and I look forward to the team coming down to learn, to teach us FECO. But I think we'll engage our neighbors at uh, Kitwe and Lusaka because they are currently doing FECO so that we can start slowly just to learn so that we can make use of the machine that's coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Maurice and the team and uh, our colleagues in Netherlands and Belgium, they are happy. Uh, we will arrange a Zoom once the machine is there, uh, once it arrives, uh, and then uh, they can go through some basics uh, and setting up and everything. As you are saying, uh, uh, all of us, we are humbled as well, the great work that you are doing, and uh, collectively, uh, we can do uh, better and we can do something. And please, uh, uh, our doctors are very happy, Anna, Dr. Ramesh, and the team, uh, whenever there are consultations, of course, we've done this before, uh, Anna and uh, our doctors are here, they are very quick, and on the team is growing. Uh, whenever there is a case, a study, or you want something uh, that to share knowledge, as we are uh, in one uh, village, a global village, where we can share information, uh, patient case studies and everything. Ramesh is uh, 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 amply and Anna and all our doctors are happy to share information uh, that uh, you can easily uh, get in touch uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, all of uh, all of our our team, and we are so grateful. And Helene, and I've seen uh, is it Marion uh, from uh, our National Police Convoy Aid. We are so grateful. And for the first time, Ian will tell you uh, the things that we've sent. Uh, some of those things uh, have been donated by National Police Convoy, and will be donating um, uh, to different institutions. Uh, and the machine is going to Dollar Central. And uh, once the machine is set up uh, and everything, uh, wherever we send uh, for, uh, please, uh, uh, if you send us some pictures and some videos to see how best uh, uh, these things are doing, I'm sure Helen uh, and the team will be very, very happy. And I've seen Helen and uh, uh, the new uh, uh, person taking uh, over the work at uh, uh, National Police Convoy. Wonderful, wonderful people. We are shipping stuff. Uh, Sharon uh, and uh, others, uh, they have been um, uh, collecting uh, things from shoes, uniforms, which will be donating uh, in Zambia to different institutions. And all of you people, you've been uh, so amazing. And uh, as we work together with COVID and everything, um, as we plan for the future in the meantime, we'll go on with uh, online um, sharing and also sending stuff uh, that are available uh, to send. And uh, finally, as we are coming to the end, uh, today is uh, my birthday actually, and uh, this is the best gift uh, I can ever get to have Ramesh speak, uh, Ian, Anna, uh, Collins, uh, Maurice, uh, Misa, and everybody. Thank you so much uh, for everything, uh, and this has been uh, amazing just to have you people uh, share uh, what uh, you have shared today, and together I'm sure we'll be able to do more and more, especially for Zambia and other countries. I remember last time when we had an uh, online Zoom lecture on uh, plastics, we had some other few doctors joining in from Mozambique, and uh, we'll open up for other nations, and wherever we can help, we will help. For those in Zambia who are doing uh, ophthalmology uh, courses, ophthalmologists uh, and others who are in there, there is a very good website again Again, I'll turn to Ramesh uh, for the great work and anybody else, uh, even those have relatives, you don't have to be an ophthalmologist or doctor uh, for you to help somebody with eye problems. Uh, you can get information. They have worked on a very powerful website. Uh, it's called uh, Ramesh, is it Good Hope, uh, uh, good Hope Hospital? Uh, if you can unmute. Yes, it's goodhopeye.org. I'll, uh -huh. I'll send a link out to you so you can share it. Yes, uh, there is a uh, goodhope.org, uh, uh, dot goodhope.org, and uh, there you can find the uh, different information about the eyes, the treatment, and how you can go about uh, on on uh, uh, that. And we've got these doctors, even those who are in the diaspora, even those in Zambia. Please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, I care for Zambia at gmail.com you can send an email and uh, we'll be able to uh, share information if you have concerns with your eyes or your relatives uh, we want you to have better eyes especially with the new dawn uh, new eyes a uh, new life we pray that um, uh, you have been uh, blessed tonight as uh, we have this interaction with i care for 
uh, for Zambia. It has been uh, an honor and I uh, will just uh, ask uh, Ian to give the vote of thanks. So we've got people joining us all the way from South Africa, Zambia and different places. Uh, we are so grateful uh, for uh, everything uh, uh, that uh, uh, you do. Ian Connor. Oh, me? I thought you were talking about you. Sorry, uh, Ian Connor, yes, please. Um, yes, thank you all. Um, I think your position on that chair, I think Sharon's chair is uh, good for Mike. <laughs> now you know who's in charge, Ian. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, look forward to uh, meeting you all again in the future. And uh, I, th I think um, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we just need... Um, this COVID thing to sort itself out and get started. Um, ra rather doing more than um, we are at the moment, although Zoom seems good. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in. Uh, apologies, uh, we've taken more than uh, uh, your time uh, that we anticipated uh, to share. Yati from London and everybody, all of you, we love you so much and thank you for your support for iCare for Zambia. Let's be there and let's help uh, people uh, in need, especially with Eyes Misa and the team in Indola. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, everybody. And this is how I've celebrated my birthday. I'm so happy. Uh, because uh, we just need to do something that uh, uh, will always uh, um, help our lives and help others. There's no better way to live except to extend uh, uh, a hand of help to somebody. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So much, Pastor. Bye. And have a great birthday. Yeah, Thank you. Have a fantastic birthday. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. you and continue your hard works, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so thank much, you. the speakers, Anna, Sugar, and Vijay. We really appreciate your work in Zambia. Thank you. I live in London, but my heart is in Zambia. So thank you so oh. much. <laughs> yes. You're very welcome. You, Simon. Well done, Simon. Thank well you. organized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Happy birthday, thank Pastor. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mama Mwale. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, uh, the Mwansas. Thank you, the Ngambis. Uh, thank you, thank you all. And uh, God let you bless you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, we'll be waiting. Wayati will be waiting for the cake from London. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, uh, thank you, brother Vesa. Thank you all, and God bless you all. Thank you, uh, brother Vesa. You raised your hand. No, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm very thankful and grateful that mm. you know people have taken to you know. Um, to that extent of helping, you know, each one of us. Mm. I'm sure my, my cousin will be pleased, you know, because she's diabetic. And yeah. Mm. yeah, with this recording, I will forward it to him. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.